can't say I've ever had any faith in politics. And politics use of digital media certainly hasn't helped. Though it sounds antithetical to the idea of democracy, I've had the suspicion that digital media undercuts deliberation since internet media began playing a significant role in elections. This land is your land. If you have the time, hear me out. I know my video doesn't have the number of views needed to build momentum that translates into what Rodolfo and DeVos call rhetorical velocity. I'm just one person. Just contribute enough of your time to watching this so Google can boost where I show up in searches. You'll give me a public voice then. To borrow Michael Warner's language, I am putting my private interests first into a disinterested public. With any luck, the idea will catch on, and I will have a voice. What I'm concerned with here is the idea that in order to be democratically elected, an individual does not have to engage in serious debate or deliberation with the public. Sure, we still have debates of more democratic formats. The popular town hall style debate has even expanded into the CNN YouTube debates. Deedal McLaughlin notes were surrounded with distrust by newsmakers and politicians alike. But unlike other debates, the panel and I won't be the only ones asking the questions. You'll be joining us on center stage. We want you to ask the candidates the questions that are on your mind by submitting. The model is still a one-way street with the appearance of deliberation. The name of the game is not to win the debate, but develop the moment with the most rhetorical velocity. What I am positing here is that as a society, we tend to elect the most effective meme creators. And note here I said effective, not prolific. The idea of rhetorical velocity as meme proliferation fits into the engagement economy Jane McGonigal outlines in her work, a system where it is less and less important to compete for attention and more and more important to compete for things like brain cycles and interactive bandwidth. She goes on to say crowd-dependent projects must figure out how to capture the mental energy and active effort it takes to make individual contributions to a larger community. That's the optimistic version. Crowdsourcing can also look a lot like outsourcing the job of politicking. As Ian Bogus notes, in many cases, politicking on social networks was a process driven entirely by voters rather than campaign. Efforts that reached far larger numbers than might have been possible previously. It sounds like individual voters have agency and influence. However, if we look at it in terms of memes, the role of the voter is reduced to propagating constructive media moments. In short, the retweet. Essentially, candidates need to act in such a way during a debate as to create the moment that gains rhetorical velocity. The idea is not as new or as edgy as it sounds. Warner points out that Addison and Steele use their newspaper, The Spectator, as a forerunner to mass media. All that has come since is simply an elaboration. In the digital mass media age, publicists found the value of circulation when Mel Gibson went on his anti-Semitic rant on police video, and that was disseminated through news networks, and the highlights were perpetuated and linked online. Not long after Mel's breakdown, Michael Richards, Kramer for those of you Seinfeld fans, lost his shit on stage, and it was captured by a cell phone camera in the hands of a private citizen. Publicity as a controlled medium was untethered for a moment before the power of the controlled meltdown quickly grew into the thing of memes, and hence free publicity. We went from Brittany shaving her head, to Lindsay Lohan's ongoing saga, to Charlie Sheen doing a line of, well, it's called Charlie Sheen. Sheen. All you people care about is readers and making money off of her. It seems like Washington was listening. The leap from Hollywood public figure to D.C. public figure is closer than it appears. So it's not hard to imagine the president as celebrity. As Warner says, publicity puts us in relation to these public figures. Who's president of the United States in 1985? Ronald Reagan. Ronald Reagan? The actor? <laughs> Then who's vice president? Jerry Lewis. I'll give you an example. This last election, we had Obama using the digital sphere as he effectively did in 2008. But he did not initially update his approach. Romney, on the other hand, seemed to shun participation with his constituents in the digital now sphere. I make sure that every new computer sold in this country after I'm president has installed on it a filter. Unfortunately for Romney, he could generate a meme a minute. I like PBS. I love Big Bird. I actually like Obama him. seemed to lay low, letting Romney propel himself into unintentional web sensation status. Then the third debate happened. At this point in the election, many politicos predicted the debate would be a make it or break it for the candidates. Then this happened. You mentioned the Navy, for example, and that we have fewer ships than we did in 1916. 
Well, Governor, we also have fewer horses and bayonets. What happened here is that Romney took a line effective from his stump speeches and recycled it in a debate. Our Navy is now smaller than any time, well, in almost 100 years. Obama, like any good media chief, had probably studied Romney's stump speeches and knew Romney was likely to use the line about the Navy as an attack. Obama parried with horses and bayonets, and a meme, a carefully constructed, orchestrated, and strategic meme, was born. Obama's call to create memes can be likened to McGonagall's analysis of Wikipedia as a game space. Propagating the meme became a good game world, with sound mechanics and a community surrounding it. But playing this game also seems to be participating in the graffiti of subculture as Warner describes it. They are taking part in the parody of mass media, and by appearing everywhere they aspire to the placeless publicity of mass print or televisualization. The individual's limited opening into the public discussion could also be viewed in terms of Young's tyrannized publics. That is, publics manipulated by officials and media publics with little access to information and communication. Indeed, how much information has any of these moments of velocity provided? It is the international system of currency which determines the totality of life on this planet. Young says deliberation is competition, and that seems true enough. Young also notes that the norms of deliberation often operate as forms of power that silence or devalue the speech of some people. Essentially, it seems, we put ourselves out of business. My question is, how long can spheres stay places of deliberation before they are besieged, along with their participants, by politics and turn into places of mass media and capitalism? Or is this the nature of democracy?